we have our beautiful BRBF figure right above there, as well as a story demand V sub U of 100 kips. That's 1.0 earthquake uh, contribution. We have a, what I'll call beta, roast me if that's not what it is, beta sub two equal to 1.0. So we are, for today's example, keeping it simple and assuming very small drifts and therefore no contributions from P delta effects. And we have two tasks today. We're gonna size our core adequately for the demand at the story. And then we're gonna find the adjusted brace strengths. And you're like, huh, I'm not quite sure about that one. If you aren't, you're in the right spot because we're gonna learn about both of them. Today is just the tip of the iceberg. So we're doing a single bay. We're not doing multi-story or getting into anything like that. But in the future, if you'd like that, let me know in the comments down below. First off, we need to convert our story demand into an axial demand on the brace. Well, in order to do this, first we'll need to find that angle. And that's simply done using the following equation. We all know and love Sokotoa. A couple clicks of your calculator that gets you 36.9 degrees. And now for a single brace configuration like you have here, that's when you just have, as the name suggests, one brace in a braced frame. You can have many other configurations, so you can check that out. You can do a quick Google if you want. Um, you know, you can do multi-storied uh, X pattern. You can do a Chevron. This one is single brace. And uh, it, it, it modifies the geometry and the angles slightly. But ultimately, we can derive P sub U in the single brace configuration using this equation. Very straightforward. Let's plug everything in. And that spits out actually very cleanly. Didn't even try to do that. Uh, 125 kips as our PU demand axial load on our brace. Next, we're very simply just gonna jump into determining the core area of steel that we need to counteract this PU demand. But before we jump into that, let's just talk very briefly about what a BRB brace is. You may not be familiar, but ultimately, if we were to take a cross section, take our butter knife out and cut right through this brace, call it section AA, what would that look like? Well, through that cross section, let's break down our components. We start off with a steel case, which I'm just gonna denote as one as I move through here. That kind of confines uh, a grout substance that is basically a jacket around our steel core. So number two, I'll call our steel core. That is just a solid piece of steel that we are specifying here today, which has uh, certain material properties. And that's really the the, the catalyst of this entire design is everything is based on this core and how you specify it. And then it extrapolates out from there into the design of your brace, into the design of your frame, ultimately the beams, the columns, the connections, the gussets, the connections to foundation, all of that comes back from how you specify this core. So it's very important. That core is encased, like I said, in a jacket of high strength grout. Um, and then that grout is held in with that outer steel tube, designated as one. Uh, it can be, the two geometries that I've seen are round tubes and square tubes, like the one I've, I've graphically shown here. I'm not sure if there's other geometries, but uh, let me know, maybe there are. But yeah, commonly circular tube, square tube. And then you have this blue dash that I'm representing here, which is our fourth component, which is basically uh, a bond preventing layer around the core need to be able to act independently of one, uh, of one another. Um, and, and really the only thing that the grout jacket is doing is confining that slender piece of steel core, um, which is the principle of the entire brace and how it works to counteract seismic cyclical loading. Keyword there is cyclical loading. So the BRB is kind of a more new lateral element. Um, it was developed, I think in like the eighties in Japan, fact check me on that, not quite sure, but it does an amazing job at combating cyclical forces, often like you see in an earthquake event, unlike a, a wind loading event. Why these ha have become so popular is that um, the brace is actually, or the steel itself is allowed to yield, but there's not a buckling failure mode that occurs when that brace goes into compression because that grout jacket is confining that steel core, keeping it from buckling. All right, we have our demand and we know a little bit more about the system. Now let's do part one and find the core area required to combat this 125 kips. We're gonna find ourselves in the steel seismic design manual in section F4.5.2, where we can get the capacity of our steel core, PYSC, uh, with the following equation. 
And to note, I know there's a lot of sub variables, but SC just stands for steel core. So there's a lot of, you know, there's multiple pieces of steel floating around this system now. So they try to keep it straight of like, what are you talking about? So SC steel core. Well, we got a couple things to find. And actually before we find those things, I like to jumble up this equation a little bit to make it more simple of uh, determining what your core steel needs to be. You could find your material strength and then you could guess a core size and then determine the capacity of that and compare that to your demand. But instead, let's speed this up a little bit because that's a little bit of an iterative process. And I can do that by first, let's sub in, not FU, PU in for PYSC. And then let's also plug in our fee since today we know we had PU, which is a strength level load uh, symbol. So we're doing strength design, which means we need to do LRFD capacity, which means we are going to be using a fee factor. Well, in this same chapter, fee for this equation equals 0 0.9. It's stated right below the equation. So all the info is provided to you, but we need to plug that in. And now we can rewrite this equation to uh, solve for A sub SC. All right, that looks a little more clear to me. We know PU already, we know phi, and now we need FY sub SC. Well, typically core strength uh, material properties vary, and you always wanna be using the lower bound strength of your core to size your core first, and then you're going to do a couple of new things afterwards in order to find your expected strength. You're starting off by assuming the worst possible steel you can get your hands on, sizing your core that way to make sure you are covered. And then, yeah, moving forward from there, you're actually gonna do the opposite and use the higher bound strength in order to determine the capacity of your core. So in this instance, that means we're gonna use 38 KSI. This range is really common, uh, you know, FY sub S between 38 KSI and 46 KSI. I can't remember off the top of my head uh, where that comes from, but that's from my notes and my SE studies and uh, is, is a range that I've used so far in designing BRBs. All of that plugged in gets us 3.66 square inches of steel that we need for our core. Now you can't just specify the exact core size that you need of 3.66 square inches. There are um, set sizes of cores that are manufactured by BRB manufacturers. And there are, there are set increments uh, between cores that you can jump up to uh, when sizing them. So you need to fall within kind of that, that criteria that meets the manufacturer's manufacturing process. And what industry standard is, at least that I have been taught, is that you can jump up and down between core sizes uh, as cl uh, using quarter inch, quarter square inch increments for braces, uh, for cores, excuse me, up to five square inches. Then cores greater than five square inches up to 10 square inches, it jumps to one half square inch increments. And then it jumps up to one square inch increments for 10 square inch cores and greater. So 3.66, that is gonna jump up to 3.75 inches squared, because that is a quarter, <laughs> a, Quarter square inch increment, my gosh, I don't know why I can't say that. So we'll use this moving forward. Uh, something to note here, do not be cons overly conservative in this step. Don't say, ah, I'm just gonna go up to four inches or five inches. You need to be very diligent with sizing your cores initially in this stage because this affects the entire design and sizes of all of your beams, all of your columns, all of your connections, your gusset plates, your connections down to foundation, the size of your foundations for the frame for your BRBs. Be careful with this. It's not intended to be heavy handed when, uh, when sizing these, okay? Remember also, we are, we are already using or sizing our cores based on a lower bound strength as it is. So the conservatism is already baked in in this step. So no need to go an extra step further there. 3.75 square inches. That is actually the answer to our first question. Now we're gonna be finding our adjusted brace strengths for both compression and tension. These forces or capacities, I should say, 
will be the things that you then use to extrapolate out and design your frames that support these braces. It's kind of a, a backwards, it's not backwards, but it's just backwards in my head from how you start off learning to design a lateral system. Typically, you have a story force that you calculated from, you know, let's say an, an ELF analysis, um, which is in our case, this VU, I'll go black here. And you design your brace to be stronger than that story force. BRBs, the cores themselves, act as what are called fuses, um, which means that when you size your brace and you construct the building and there is a lateral event, we'll call it a an earthquake, that brace is going to be on purpose the quote unquote weak spot in your structure. And that core will yield inelastically first and dissipate energy, keeping the building actually safe uh, rather than it just being overly strong and and fighting against the forces of the building it is designed to yield on purpose it's a more efficient system it's a more ductile system and it's a safer system now what that means is you as the engineer uh, are relying on that brace being the quote-unquote fuse or the weak spot of your lateral system it must yield you can't have a column yield first. You can't have a beam yield first. The brace needs to yield first. And in order to do that, the frames around this brace need to be stronger than the brace and the core. So you start off by sizing the core for the story force. Then you determine the capacity of that brace and of that core. And then you design everything else around that to be stronger than that element. Next, we're gonna find ourselves in the Steel Seismic Design Manual in section F4.2.2a, where they define your adjusted brace strengths in compression and tension. You get those with the following equations. A couple of variables that we don't have yet that we need to define. First off, what I'm calling beta, that is your compression strength adjustment factor. This typically is in a range between 1.2 and 1.1. For today's example, we are going to say it's 1.15, which is, as I have been told, is conservative at the start of your design. Something else with BRB design is that you actually work very closely with the BRB manufacturer um, because the, the type of BRB that you are getting uh, varies across manufacturers a little bit in the way that they do things, the way that they procure their braces. So you work alongside them, you work alongside their engineers, to go back and forth to make sure your system uh, fine-tuned for, for your building. We also need what I'm calling W. This is your strain hardening adjustment factor. And commonly the range is between 1.3 and 1.5. Today, we are going to assume 1.4. Again, I've told, been told that is usually conservative at this point in time. But again, if you're, if you're further in your design and you really wanna dial that in, uh, talk with the BRB manufacturer that you are expected to choose for your project. RY is the next thing. And for anybody curious, this is the, what is this? The third edition of the Seismic Design Steel Manual. And uh, I think the new uh, fourth one came out with like the gold um, new steel manual, but correct me here, that's what I'm using here today. I will say that I have a decent amount, oh, you can see, of tabs from when I was studying for the SE. Not a crazy amount though. I actually think once you dive into this uh, provision, it does a very good job of laying things out in a, in a sensible order, if you will. Um, but one of my major tabs, so that I made green, is uh, my RYRT table. And it is table A3.1. I'll throw it up here on the screen, but it has all of the different uh, RY and RT values for the different material type that you, of steel that you are uh, trying to design for. And ultimately RY is the ratio of the expected yield stress to the specified minimum yield stress, FY, of that material. In our instance, we said we're using A992 steel, so RY is going to be equal to 1.1, which leaves us with PYSC. Well, PYSC is really equal to RY, FYSC. 
And so this just means when you multiply these two together, you are now using the higher bound expected strength of your steel core. Well, now that actually gives us everything. And those two values actually give us the answer for question number two of today's overall example. So technically you're done there. Uh, something I will mention uh, that is a, a benefit of BRBs as a vertical lateral system that you won't see it here today is that these two values, so the brace strength in compression and the brace strength in tension are very close to one another, which is a big positive because when you are designing your braces and your columns and your connections, where ultimately you're going to have um, counteracting forces when you're, you're doing out the, the statics of your overall frame, having compression forces very similar to tension forces um, helps balance the overall demand at all of your joints uh, and at all of your connections, which makes for a, a more efficient frame and less beefy connections overall, which is a big positive of BRB frames. Uh, that's it for today's example. From this point on, you would move forward and start uh, sizing your beams, sizing your columns, sizing your gusset plates, sizing your connections down to your foundation, uh, and everything in between there. So if that is something of interest, leave me a comment down below if you want me to, to expand further on this. So yeah, this is Rich with Team Kesteva. Like, subscribe if you're enjoying this content, and I'll catch you in the next one. Peace.